Building a headphone is really expensive, and I'm gonna tell you guys exactly how much it costs, how much it made, and the problems I faced along the way in batch one. Let's talk about it. This is Project Omega. I'm sure you know what this is. If you don't, then you can check out this other video. I released my own headphone made here in-house from the ground up, and golly, has it been an expensive process. Before I get too far into this, I wanna note that batch two is open right now for sale, so for the next week and a half, you'll be able to buy these. Then orders close, we build them for three months, ship them, and the next batch opens. We're doing four batches total. Let's get into the breakdown. So. First things first, these were selling on the first batch for $899. The whole headphone assembled what you see right here. We did the first batch at a slight discount. Normally they are $999. We sold roughly 226 units, which came in at $203,174. Wow, that sounds great. So you look at what it cost. Now I'm gonna go through and do an actual breakdown here, but the leftover, after all of this was spent up on the various parts, labor, all that was $12,249. That was the profit from batch one. I don't know, man, that is some pretty terrible profit, but I'm gonna break down why and why in the future that should be a little bit different for the next batch. So first things first, let's talk about the things that went wrong, the things that went right, the things that changed, and then we'll go into the actual like kind of per item breakdown. The first thing that went wrong is this. These are the actual SLS cups that Omega is made out of. There's a reason these are SLS and that's because it is strong and light. You could make this same cup out of PLA that's almost hollow and it would still be about 10 grams heavier per cup in the PLA. Now this one, I'm sure you can tell looking at it, it looks like crap. This is all deformed. There's weird lines all over it. The finishing is inconsistent. It just doesn't look good. Compare it to this one right here. This looks much better. We have uniform lines across the surface that don't change. There's no weird warping. Everything has nice flat edges. This one just looks like a piece of melty crap in comparison. This is the first thing that went wrong. These SLS cups all came in like this. There was maybe 11 of the entire batch that were usable out of like 500-ish uh, individual SLS components that came in. Or just the cups uh, in SLS, by the way. We had another 500-ish of these come in in SLS that also had their own problems. Now, the batch of these that came in that was bad, which we'll go into in just a little bit, was $9,187. Luckily, there was still enough time in the order that we could reorder these from a different manufacturer, which is what I ended up doing here. This is a manufacturer who does SLS in the United States. They did a significantly better quality job on these, and this is where I will be getting my SLS components in the future. The reorder of this specific SLS part, not counting the other one, was $15,548 plus an additional $759 for shipping. There was one of the first big problems. A few other things that weren't necessarily problems, but were just additional expenses I hadn't counted on, was this. These are the pads I was originally using. It is the Dakoni LCD suede pad. Really, really comfortable pad. Super, super nice. Love this pad. Um, but I stumbled upon another combination of materials from Dakoni that worked out just a little bit better. It ended up improving the frequency response by about two decibels across the board. And so we ended up going with this custom made pad instead. The downside is, is I had already ordered all of these pads for the headphones. We have a ton of these now. Both batches together there, uh, one batch was around $4,700, another batch was around $4,500. I also ordered foam from Dakoni, which was an additional $200. We ended up going with a custom Listen More cable, which is made by headphones.com. I really, really, really like these cables. It's also not super long. For me, this is long enough that I can plug them up, have like an amp over there and still have plenty of length if I'm like leaning back in my chair. Like this is some pretty good distance. The cables were $4,422 for this batch. Then there's the headbands. The headband material on top is a vegan suede, the same thing as the pads. It has, you might be able to see the DMSD logo stamped into the side right there. And there was a problem with the headbands. So these have the right number of clicks on them, but this cap screwed in right here. 
So while these had the correct number of clicks to be able to go down, the cap was stopping them so they couldn't extend out all the way. So we had to get an additional 10 millimeter rod to screw onto the end of these to make them long enough. That was an additional expense, and these headbands, which are custom, are much nicer than the headbands I was originally showing off with a headphone at CanJam SoCal. It's just much more sturdy. It does spin freely, which I've seen some people say they don't like the headband to spin freely. The bright side is, is these can articulate to a lot of head shapes very easily. Then we get into packaging. I got these boxes, which here's a broken one. I mean, that's already kind of a storytelling in itself. And then there's this foam that the headphones fit inside of or any way the headphones are supposed to fit inside of, they don't. Both the foam and the bands are assembled to slightly a different spec than what we had originally planned on, and so the two don't actually fit together. Like, you maybe get it like this a little bit, but then it sticks out the top. So, all of this foam had to go, and we had to buy new packing materials. There's also a good number of boxes that got dinged up on the way that we're just not using. Failure rates were pretty good, but there were a number of units that we just could not ship because there was a QC problem with either the headband being scratched, the driver not measuring properly. There were tolerances in the driver, so we had to order way more drivers than we actually ended up using in the shipped units, which this is actually a pretty well-known driver. It's Peerless's 50 millimeter uh, dynamic driver for headphones. If you compare it to a lot of things that are being used in high-end flagship headphones, a lot of headphones will use drivers that are like under a couple of dollars for their expensive headphones. Realistically, I'm actually paying a lot more than most people do for drivers. But driver cost is something that isn't necessarily indicative of the quality of the headphone. I think that boils down to frequency response and comfort. Either way, I like these drivers. Tolerances on them were good, uh, but we still had some failures we had to account for. This is something that I'm holding in my hand that we were working on because some people want custom colors with their Omegas. And there are only a couple that I just randomly picked from batch one that I give custom colors to just because it's a bit of a painful process to go through and swap them out and line them up with the names of the shipping labels and all those things while we're focusing on a million other things. But I'm trying to work on a kit where you can just do this, pop this off, pop a different color on, and you're good. Maybe ship this little 3D printed uh, pry tool that you just put on here and press with your thumb and ship that with a pair of these or something like that all together. It also ends up that this SLS piece is relatively difficult to print and a number of these came out warped in weird ways. So we ended up starting to 3D print these in-house using a fuzzy skin setting that gives them a bit more of a grippy texture with the uh, face of it down on the print bed to give it a nice texture right here. This is probably how we're gonna do these from now on. It just makes a lot more sense financially and the quality is significantly more consistent than when I was SLS printing these because getting these done in SLS just had too much variance for a part that is strictly aesthetic and not functional to the sound of the headphone. So for these aesthetic parts, we're gonna be printing these here in the building from now on. There are also things like tooling uh, equipment, other stuff like that that we needed for the first batch. So you know what, let's go through this list real quick. Cables, $4,422. The original SLS caps, $6,911, uh, which some of those we had to reorder. I think I actually forgot to put that on this list. The first batch of SLS cups, $9,787. The second batch of SLS cups, $15,548. Uh, the shipping for those, $759. Headbands, $14,300. The original pads, $4,700. The second set of pads, $4,500. Extra foam we needed for it, $200. $5,790 in drivers. $559 in stainless steel mesh that we use for the baffles. $447 in flat adhesives. $190 in liquid adhesives. Uh, $192 in filament for these things. $340 in nuts and bolts. Um, we have four different types of packing materials we needed, which was $148, $348, $270, and $4,000. We had $6,300 in tooling. The actual space renting out to build these headphones was $11,500. $15,700 for one person in labor and $4,300 for another person in labor. And then roughly $7,216 in just various additional small pieces of equipment we needed back there. So like a few extra bits of shelving, 
um, a couple of tables, an additional printer, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then $180 worth of the three and a half millimeter jacks. I also just realized I forgot the soldering and wire stuff on here, which it probably isn't that much, maybe another $150 worth of soldering equipment and all that, um, which comes out to $12,249 in profit. Cost there being $118,607, which is taken out of the $130,856 that's left after distribution. Uh, shipping, customer support and photography and all that, which is done by headphones.com, which took out $72,318. So $12,249, we take out the other batch. I had to order these, I don't remember what that was, um, but that hurt a fair bit. And then a few hundred extra dollars for other little things, soldering stuff and things like that. Probably a little less for the soldering stuff, maybe like 150 bucks for soldering stuff. But ballpark between 11 and $12,000 leftover profit. Now, the bright side is a lot of these costs were between things that had to be redone, um, various mistakes and other things like that that happened, like with this crappy SLS that came in the first time, or learning mistakes with the pads, with the boxes. And now we have a roof over our heads and the equipment and tooling, so a lot of those costs have kind of been eliminated from that because batch one paid for a lot of those things. None of this is really paying back all of the research and development and gear that I spent over the two years that I was working on this. So the lasers and printers and all of those things. As far as I'm concerned, the money that I spent on all of that is just in the void right now. If we were counting all of that, the whole project would be significantly in the negative still. But since we have a lot of these processes sorted now, it means that batch two is gonna be notably more profitable. It also means that I feel very happy about where this headphone is priced at because if this had costed any less we wouldn't have been able to ship batch one it was right at the exact price necessary to be able to deal with all of the faults and all of the extra things uh, that went wrong to be able to still warranty all of the units so if something breaks someone can you know ship it back to us and we can repair it the price balanced out perfectly. Which, if you're wondering why Omega is priced at what it's priced at, this breakdown is exactly why. Profit margins are probably a bit thinner on this than they are on a normal product. I mean, definitely a lot thinner on batch one. But just to give you a little bit of insight into the industry and how these things work, a hell of a lot of understanding of the problems associated with manufacturing headphone. So far, all the feedback I've gotten on batch one getting in people's hands is really exciting. People have been extremely positive about the units they've gotten in. The feedback's been really, really cool. A lot of people are telling me this is like replacing their whole headphone collection, which is crazy wild awesome to hear. There are still some people waiting on units. The units that are yet to be shipped are actually assembled and ready to go, but we're waiting on some more cables to arrive because about half the cables showed up late. Uh, all of those people have been informed that we are waiting on the cables for the units and as an I'm sorry, they are also all getting a set of the OG pads alongside their normal pads extra in the box. I would ship it out with this one, but uh, this cable doesn't work, so this was a bad one. It's just like a demo cable. So all of that said, batch two is live right now. It will be live until probably September 2nd or within a few days of that. We might extend it out like an extra week, just depending on if orders start going crazy or something like that. But right now we're planning on having orders open until September 2nd. Then we'll close orders, start working on those units for three months, ship them out, and then it will be on to batch three out of four. And that is my update on everything going on with Project Omega. Oh, and here's the frequency response for 125 of those units. You can see the unit variation. So that's gonna wrap it up, guys. If you like this video, leave a like down below. Comment letting me know what you want to see in the future. If you wanna get active in the community, you can at the forum or Discord, both available at the link in the video description. As always, don't forget to stick around, subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Till next time, guys. Peace.